Number one, drunk. I was very depressed. I had been having a really bad month. I mean, I don't want to go over all the bad things that were happening to me at the time. There is really no benefit to doing so. But it had been a horrible month for me, and I was depressed. And because I was depressed, I fell into an awful month of drinking. Uh, people who have gone on long drinking binges will understand what I'm about to explain. I was drinking heavier and heavier throughout the weeks which just made me more depressed and more dependent upon the alcohol. After a while, the alcohol doesn't just wash away some of the feeling. It is needed to take away the pain of the alcohol, too. So it just keeps on doubling over and over again. I got toward the idea that drinking in my home every day was just making things worse. So I had the genius idea that I would go out and take a stroll. The sun was shining bright that day, and the countryside looked so nice, and I was so drunk to begin with already, that I decided to go out and enjoy the day. I walked down the road for a bit. I owned a nice house, in an area surrounded by nature. So I took my bottle, and I went out into it. I just got drunker and drunker as I went out and I was walking through some fields which were covered in flowers. I have to tell you about this because it was really one of the strangest drinking benches I had ever been on. I was so drunk that, of course, everything was unbalanced and stuff, but everything in the field was bright and beautiful and just overwhelmed me. And really from there, I'm not sure what happened, because I blacked out. When I woke up, there were several issues. First, I was still drunk. I was fine with that, though, because being drunk would feel better than the massive hangover I would have when it was through. It was also dark outside, and it was difficult to get my bearings from what had been the case before. It had been so bright out before, so overwhelming to my senses and somewhat beautiful. And now it was nothing like that. I began staggering, and I realized how far away I was from my home. Or, more accurately, I realized I was far away from my home, but I really didn't know how far. I didn't know exactly where I was. I found the bottle that I had brought with me, and to my surprise there was still some alcohol left in it. I am a little ashamed to admit that I did start drinking it again. Even though I was still drunk, and really drunk, I didn't really want to risk sobering up. Yeah, I know it sounds weird, but as bad as I felt, I knew I'd feel worse if I sobered up. My goal was to find my way back to a road, so then I could find a way to follow that I could get home. But it was hard to do because I really had no clear idea where I was to begin with. After a long time, I made it to the road. I was finally able to follow the road back to my house. After all this time, there was nothing I was looking forward to more than finally being able to get into my own bed. But as I began walking up the driveway to my home, I noticed a few things were wrong. There was a truck parked in the yard off in the driveway. It wasn't the truck that I had ever seen before. And not only that, there was a light on in the second floor of my house. I didn't let this bother me at first, telling myself that I could have left the light on myself. But when I saw the shadow of a person in the second floor window, I got very freaked out. Someone had broken into my home. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't call the police as I had no means upon myself to do that. I was worried about approaching anyone directly and I was still really drunk. I had the brilliant idea of getting a weapon and then maybe entering the house from the back door. That way I might have some sort of an advantage. So I crept along the side of the house and into the backyard. 
there was, to my luck, a pair of hedge clippers in the backyard. I grabbed those and found my way over to the back door. The back door was locked, but I never had a good lock put on it. It would always come open, easily, with just the right amount of force. So I tried to force the back door open. But it was proving to be much harder to do. And I began to get impatient when I was not getting the results that I wanted. I was always able to get this door open easily before. And didn't think I was so drunk that I couldn't accomplish something that I accomplished so easily before. And that was when the light to the kitchen, which the back door opened into, came on. I was still holding the hedge clippers, and both me and them were visible through the window in the door. I was expecting to see a big guy, like a robber or something, but what I saw was a teenage girl, and she looked terrified. The girl had been frozen in place for a second, and then she turned and ran. I heard her scream something I will never forget. Dad! There's a guy outside her back door with hedge clippers! Even as drunk as I was, I realized exactly what had happened. This was not my house. I had stumbled upon someone else's house and nearly broke into it in a drunk fit while I was holding a pair of hedge clippers. Well, I immediately dropped the hedge clippers, then I ran back to the road as quickly as I could. As I got to the end of the driveway, I heard a gunshot behind me. I expected to feel a gunshot as well, but that never happened. Either it was a warning shot or the shooter missed me, but I really didn't care to figure out which one. No one came after me, and I ran and stumbled down the road as long as I could. I kept worrying that the police were going to show up at some point and arrest me, but that never happened. I finally came upon my own home around dawn. I fell into my bed and slept for nearly 24 hours. When I got up, on my hangover, that's a scary story for another day. Number 2. The Swimming Hole I wasn't sure how to tell the story at first. It didn't happen to me, but I feel like I should tell it in first person. My grandma was born in the 1930s. Thankfully, she is still hanging on today, but when she tells me stories, they come from a world that I could never even imagine. So I will try my best to tell you what happened. My grandma grew up in the country, and not the country that most people are used to. When someone has a house they buy out in the hills, they have cable or phones and electricity. My grandma didn't have any of that. She lived in a shack. And eventually she was one of 11 children that lived in that shack. They often did not have food, and they often relied on their dad going hunting for food. So this was the 1930s, and since it is, things were very, very different. My grandma was only five years old at the time. She had a little brother who was possibly about two. And although she didn't tell me why, one day they were out at a swimming hole her parents were off doing something, and they left my grandma, who was five years old, to watch her younger brother. It is always weird when she tells me this story. I cannot fathom having a five-year-old being responsible for a two-year-old. But she assures me that this was not out of the ordinary for the time and place that she lived. So while her parents, who would be my great-grandparents, were off doing something, this five-year-old girl, in the middle of nowhere, was left to watch a child less than two years old, right next to a swimming hole. Well, this is where it gets weird. I know that an 80-year-old memory is probably really flawed, but she swears up and down she saw something that looked like an arm grab her little brother, and he fell into the swimming hole. Being five years old, my grandma could not yet swim. So she began yelling and screaming, trying to get the attention of her parents. But she didn't know what else to do. She ran over to the swimming hole, and she tried to grab her little brother. But she was unable to reach him. And the entire time he was yelling at someone who wasn't there, 
to let go of him. It didn't take too long, and to the screaming drew the attention of my great-grandparents. They came over and found their son flailing around for his life in the swimming hole. So her dad was able to jump into the water. He grabbed his son. My grandma still swears to this day that when he grabbed the boy and pulled him out of the water, she saw an arm and a hand wrapped around his leg. And when her dad tugged hard enough, the hand let go and went back under the water. Now, a lot of things could have happened here. It could have been her imagination that she noticed the hand there. It is possible she never ever saw the arm, and her memory added it later. And I think some other people will contend that it was probably a ghost. But here's the thing. It doesn't really matter what it was. My grandma believes she saw what she told us. Whether she did or not, it was a horrifying image to her. For some reason, either she really saw this, or her memory added it later. Either way, it was terrifying for her. I mean, she believed that she witnessed something that she saw someone pull her younger brother into the water and try to drown him. And that, on its own, is so damn scary. But of course, being likely worth the time, her parents punished her for letting it happen. I just can't see it. Punishing a five-year-old for not properly watching a two-year-old when the parents should have been there watching. Number three, fall. This is obviously the worst thing to ever happen to me in my entire life. I've also told this story a few times, but never to a scary story narrator before. I was 13 years old when this happened and it is hard actually to imagine how it even happened. But it should also serve as a warning to people as well. A normal situation can turn bad very quickly. We were visiting some relatives out on the ridge. Getting to the ridge was a nice and beautiful ride out into the country, and our aunt's house was way out on the ridge. Now personally, I really didn't like sitting around with the adults. Most of them were sitting around and drinking beer and the like, talking about the old days. I was never into that. I'm still not. Plus, I was the only kid my age who was there. All of the other children were younger, and I didn't want to hang out with them. So I asked if I could go out hiking. Everyone was okay with me doing this. They just told me that I shouldn't go out too far. The ridge was huge, and there was a lot of country to get around through it so it would be easy to get lost there. I brought a bottle of water with me. Well, not really water. It was some sort of punch that my aunt had in the freezer. It was sugar-free, of course. This is just a side comment. I'm curious if other people have noticed it as well. There seems to be a whole lot of diabetics in rural areas, so whenever we had family reunions or parties or any kind of get-togethers, there was always a lot of sugar-free alternatives. Since maybe a lot of people will hear the story, I'm just wondering if others have noticed this too. Okay, back to the story. On this day when I was hiking, I noticed that there was something different than I had seen before. Where, for the most part, the hills were covered in grass and trees and such, this time I noticed a rock face on one side of a hill. So I wanted to climb down and see what was there. As I got closer, I noticed that there was a small creek that was draining into a waterfall over the rock face. There was only one way for me to be able to get down that side of the hill to see that waterfall, which is what I wanted to do. So that meant I had to climb down the rock face. I was hesitant at first because I wasn't much of a climber, but I finally decided to go ahead and give it a shot. It wasn't a high hill and should be easier to get down. So I started on my way down. The rocks were a little damp, but that didn't worry me. I was able enough to get a good solid grip as I climbed down, and I did so very carefully in order to not slip on the wetness. My problem is that I was paying too much attention to not slipping on the rocks. I didn't realize that some of the rock shelves I was holding onto 
were not as strong as I assumed they were. I don't remember a whole lot of exactly what happened, but I must have grabbed a rock shelf that had a crack in it or something, because when my weight was pulling on that rock, it cracked in half. It's the fall itself and the landing that I didn't remember much of, but I do recall waking up from being blacked out. And when I did, I was wet and uncomfortable, and it took a few moments to realize that I had somehow fallen behind the waterfall. Although I couldn't tell exactly why, when I tried to write myself to stand up, I was unable to do it. I was having a hard time thinking straight, and my head hurt. When I put my hands to the hurting area, I saw that I was bleeding from my head. I'm not sure how long I remained conscious. I know that I passed out at some point. When I came to again, I tried calling for help. And I actually did this for so long and so hard that my voice eventually gave away. The one good thing I had going for me was that, being so close to the waterfall, I, I wasn't in danger of dehydrating. But little good that would do if there was no one to find me. One of the only things I can really remember is hearing what I thought was someone calling my name. I was half out of it at the time, so I wasn't really sure. But it didn't seem to matter anyway, as I was not able to call back. I did try, but as I mentioned, my voice was still a bit too rough to call back. At one point, there was a noise that I heard, and I had looked and seen someone standing by the waterfall. I was happy to finally be rescued by someone, but when I tried to get his attention, despite my voice recovering, the figure moved and never came to help me. He at first simply stood there, a silhouette in the water. Finally, I saw the silhouette leave, and I was by myself once again. I think I came to terms with the fact that I was likely going to be not found and was going to die. I convinced myself that the shadow I had seen of a figure was nothing more than my imagination or something, and it really didn't matter if it had actually been someone, since he did nothing to try to rescue me. More time went by, and I went in and out of it mostly. Several times when I was conscious, I again saw someone in silhouette several times. The last time was when I was up for only a short while, and I felt like I was going to die behind that waterfall. I kept asking the shadow person to come and help me. He never did. The next time I awoke was in a hospital bed. I must have blacked out and remained out until someone located me. I recovered in time, but when I finally was able to talk to my family, I asked how they had found me. Someone had left an envelope on the door of a different home. The owners didn't know whom, but the envelope had a message on it. A young boy is injured and could be found here. Inside was a map leading to a waterfall. The man of that house and his son went on and they found me. And they brought me to their own home and called an ambulance. The people who found me never knew who left the envelope. But I knew it had to have been the shadow that I had seen. But then I always wondered why he didn't try to help me himself. I'll never know but I am thankful he left the envelope. Hey y'all, Kill the Orange Cat here. If you like this video, please let me know by hitting the like button. If you're not already subscribed to Kill the Orange Cat, please feel free to click the subscribe button and bell below, or click the icon of Ichigo the Cat that will appear at the end of this closing. Leave me a comment and share this video with someone you think might enjoy it. If you have an original story you'd like narrated on Killer Orange Cat, please email it to the address included in the description. But most importantly, don't forget to make sure to check in your closet and check under your bed because you never know where a Killer Orange Cat might be hiding. Good night.